So welcome back. We'll be starting our second session. And uh, our, we're starting with a presentation from Mr. Jeff Houston, who needs no interaction. He'll be talking about the end of days. You know, these policy SIG meetings get more and more people every time, don't they? Well, welcome, all 10 of you. <laughs> it's good to see you. Um, my name's Jeff Houston. I work with APNIC. I actually do measurement and analysis inside labs. Um, and what I've been asked to do is actually do a rundown of the broader picture of V4 addresses uh, inside APNIC as a registry. Um, and it seemed to me like it really is the case of end of days, but not the Schwarzenegger version. It's actually the registry version, okay? So this is the IPv4 allocation picture sitting right inside the APNIC registry. So on January the 27th, here's the total picture of everything that is under APNIC's stewardship, administration, whatever. So APNIC looks after 53.1 slash 8s or 890 million slash 32s. And you can see on the numbers there, most of these have been assigned. So if you look in the daily stats file, you get sort of 80, 883 million of them marked as they're somewhere else, we don't hold them. On that day, 2.8 million, 2.9 really, are marked as being, that's what we got left. And interestingly now, the larger number, 4.4 million, simply has a single word denotation, it's called reserved. So publicly, they just look like they're reserved. I should note at this point, I've only used public data. I have no idea what happens inside the registry. I don't work there, I work in Canberra. So I'm using the same data that anyone else could use and anyone else could see. So I'm not relying on any particular magic incantations to give you deeper reason, it's all just public data. So let's have a look at that available pool. Um, here is the available pool every day since January 1, 2011, which as you might recall was just prior to the IANA handing out its last slash eights. And what you actually see, look on your laptop because this is so detailed. Um, you actually see us run down from um, 40 million addresses down to 20 million. We then got three slash eights, it jumps up to seven million. Um, we then start allocating again, drop down into, sorry, 70 million, drop down just below 60 million, get the final allocation, right? And then run out basically because we get swamped and by April of that year, we're down to 16 million addresses. So that was a really quick drain as you see from where we were at the start of the year, the final allocation, to the point where the last slash eight policy was activated. Boom. Now, we trundled on doing the last slash eight policy, and it looks kind of linear, possibly a bit accelerating. But for those folk who are long-term attendees, <laughs> and you've been around for, since 2014, you will remember we actually swept up what we called the various pool, the really old legacy blocks. We handed them all back to the IANA, and the IANA did redistributions of those legacy blocks twice a year for some years. So the slight uptick, twice a year, um, and they got smaller and smaller as the years went on, was the point where we got reallocations, I'm sorry, returned legacy addresses coming back. And the policy to redistribute those was different to the last slash eight. So when we got it, it sort of disappeared more quickly than the normal run of the mill 124 to everyone. Different policy, different consumption model. Um, let's get rid of the inputs. So this is the same graph, but I'm only looking at out the door. In other words, consumption. So I'm not looking at the refresh, I'm simply going, this is the rate that APNIC was getting rid of addresses. And that 
sort of since 2011, there's kind of three, or four really, if you count the first panic. There's panic, there's sort of model one, model two, model three. Somewhere between mid-2014 and mid-2016 was an entirely different consumption model, which was actually a lot, lot higher than the one we've had since mid-2016 and the one earlier. I'm actually not sure, as I don't think the policy changed, but I suspect the number of folk lining up was substantially different for those 24 months. And it's certainly clear in the figures there that there was a different consumption model. Here we go. Projections. Now, all of these projections have precisely the same underlying theory. Tomorrow is a lot like today. So if you understand today, you can project tomorrow. But in actual fact, today isn't not only a good judgment, and I've actually used three different windows. Three months, one year, three years. And it's not obvious here, but it's more obvious there, that this is a little bit unusual. Since the 1st of January 2018, there's actually been some variance in the way stuff has gone out the door. You know, rate one, rate two, rate three. There's three very, very different rates of consumption. And oddly enough, if you take a 90-day model, um, you end up with projection one because the most recent three months is the slowest consumption rate. And if that were to continue, those 2.8 whatever million addresses that we talked about, God, take my word for it back there, 2.884 million addresses will actually last at that rate until the 23rd of February 2023. But if I take a one-year model, the one-year model actually encompasses that steeper part into the average. That pulls it back. So the 400-day model is actually a few months earlier, 9th of October, two years' time. And if I take a long-term model, three years, I get to the 30th of October, 2021. So it's kind of, you can pick any, any date you like out of all of that because it's not clear why those phases. So there's some uncertainty as exactly when this is going to happen. On the other hand, there could be folk out there who are going, oh my God, we better get in our application for our bit of the last slash eight right now. We get snowed under and all disappears next week. This is merely a projection based on previous behaviour. It's hard to tell where the panic ever actually eventuates and what it might mean. So that's the available pool. But as we pointed out before, there's a second pool. We mark them reserved. And there's actually a lot of addresses there, that many, 4.4 million. This is the same period since 1st of January 2011, looking at the size of that pool. Interestingly, it was small, and then about the time of exhaustion, it rose from a little under a million to six, uh, six million addresses. I have no idea why. Um, Almost immediately, about a million went out the door as something else. They got marked as something other than reserved, and things were stable. There are a couple of events which are sort of big changes, but on the whole, the most recent trend, oddly enough, is that the reserve pool is growing in size and has been growing since the start of January 2017. Um, and then I looked at the date in the daily snapshot files when each prefix was first marked reserved. So what we can say, is it on the next slide? There it is. More than half of that reserve pool has been reserved since the dawn of time of APNIC. Since the first time we actually started publishing openly the reserve pool, we existed before then, but we never actually openly said this is the list of ad reserved addresses. So I'm using public data. This date, nine years ago, is the dawn of time for me. And more than half of those addresses have been reserved for that long. Um, don't know why, 
But in October 2015, a million addresses were removed from the reserve pool, almost in one transaction. Again, I can't tell why easily, but there have been a couple of step functions. But the age function says that of that 4.4 million, a tiny amount has actually only been reserved for a year. If I look at two years, it's only half a million addresses. All of the rest of the addresses have been reserved continuously for much longer than two years. So reserved almost seems to be a permanent state, not a temporary state. But I'm not responsible inside. I can't answer to that. The registry folk will have to say that. But this data says reserved. There's an awful lot of long-term reserved, and I can't tell you why. It's not. I did something there different. I looked at the reservations in terms of the number of prefixes every day and looked at the size of that and then looked at the aggregate of new addresses that got reserved and addresses that got marked as unreserved. Because it's not just you mark it reserved and it stays there. Every day the registry, or every working day, because it's really obvious in the stats, no one works on Saturday and Sunday, um, a number of addresses get marked as reserved and pretty typically addresses get removed. So above that horizontal line is the volume of the number of prefixes that got marked and the number of prefixes that got unmarked. So there is this continual activity of unmarking reserved blocks, but the net result is that the number of blocks keeps on increasing. It's up to currently 450 blocks. Now, that's not talking about size. That's just the number of blocks. And so we can plot that together starting at January 2014 and take that as zero day. The number of reserved entries just keeps on growing. The amount of, of number of entries that get taken out unreserved grew at a lower rate. Huge amount got unreserved in terms of number, 400. Big clean-up day, October the 15th. 400 blocks got taken out of reserved. Well done, working very hard. Um, for a while, the sort of number in equaled the number out, but since then, there's been more in than out. And the bottom line is the difference between the, the red and the green. So what you're actually finding is, since about, I don't know, late 2016, more prefixes are being reserved than unreserved. The pool just keeps on growing. Um, this is the same thing just looking at addresses, not prefixes. So you see the pool size grows, huge unreserved cleanup, huge marking of reserved, bit of a cleanup, and off we go again. And again, this horizontal line, if it's above the line, those are addresses that got marked as reserved. If it's below the line on that day, those addresses got marked as unreserved. They got taken out of the reserve pool. Um, here's the same data, just in address volume. So we start at 2014. A lot of addresses got marked as reserved in terms of addresses late 2014, largely keeping pace with each other. That net change is a lot slower. But overall, more addresses are entering reserved state than leaving it since 2017. What's going on? I don't work in registry, and I'm not using private data. This is just public data. So as far as I can see from the data that gets published, if I discount the long-term reserved folk, 2.2 million addresses, and just look at the bit that's more recent. The average period that any prefix is reserved is actually 26 months. And if I, instead of doing trans prefix weighted, I actually look at address weighted average. If we reserve, we reserve an address, that address will probably stay reserved for 40 months, which is quite a long period if the story is quarantine. I do not know the story, but that's what the stats say. So what I see from the data, a really small number of those large old legacy blocks are being removed from the reserve pool. And there's more movement in the small blocks that enter reserved. So if you enter reserved, you're going to stay there for on average about two years. 
but the big overhang, 3.6 million addresses are just permanently sitting in the old pool. And quite frankly, if you're going to make an impact on V4, the big impact is that 3.6 million. Exactly who they are, why they are, they've been reserved since data shows reservation. So I can't tell you, but certainly that's where the biggest pool is. Um, advertising reserve prefixes. Don't do that. <laughs> we mark 1,501 prefix blocks as reserved. Um, 34 of those blocks contain advertised prefixes. Don't do this. They're not your addresses. Stop it. Um, 14,336 addresses are sitting in the BGP table as of late January. <laughs> um, the rest, um, that number there, uh, is, is what we see as unadvertised. So there's a certain amount of, I don't know, uncertainty out there. Some folk think that they have a right to use it, evidently, because they are. Um, this is the percentage of the reserve pool and looking at their age profile in BGP. So the first observation, that's 100% of the reserve pool, more than half of the reserved addresses have never been seen in BGP for the last 25 years. And when I say never been seen, I'm using route views as the BGP record since they started doing it in uh, 97, I believe. 95, a while ago. <laughs> um, so 57% of addresses, route views has no record of ever seeing them. This is the age profile of the rest of reserved. 90% of the reserved addresses haven't been seen for the past two years in the advertised, you know, in BGP. So almost all of these addresses are old and haven't been used forever. There's some age profiles of individual days. That's the cumulative result. That's reserved. But we said we had all these assigned addresses. 883 million. But I only see 768 million in the routing table. Same kind of view since January 2015. Daily view of the number of assigned addresses visible in BGP every single day. Fair enough. Um, obviously, if it's not... A, Advertised, it's unadvertised. This is the other side of this. We assigned them, can't see them in BGP. And, you know, it's kind of interesting. It goes down, goes up. Comes down, goes really down, goes up. Goes down, goes up. There's a certain amount of movement around these addresses from being advertised to not being advertised. Um, the current total as of preparing this, end of January, it was 114 million blah, blah, blah. A lot. 114 million addresses can't be seen in BGP. Um, in percentage terms, 13%. It's actually quite a lot. 13% of the assigned pool is currently invisible. It's been around that number since 2015. That 13% line uh, you sort of came down a little bit to around 12%, goes back up. But in percentage terms, it's what, one in uh, six, one in seven, around there. Um, what about age? Again, we take every dump in route views and we assemble the last time these unadvertised addresses were last addressed. The cumulative age profile. 68% um, of them have been seen since basically 21 years ago, right, at some point, 32% I've never seen them. So we assigned them, they're allocated, never been advertised as far as I can tell. So 32% of these addresses are invisible, that 100% refers to what I can see. So of the ones that I can see, then the age profile tends to be that these unadvertised addresses are relatively old. The 50% point is more than five years. 40% of those addresses 
have not been seen for 10 years. And if I go to 20 years, 80% of these addresses haven't been advertised for 20 years. So a lot of this unadvertised pool is actually relatively old. <coughs> Half of it, more than five years old. Um, why does this differ? Oh, the registry date. So this is not when I last saw it in BGP. This is the date that APNIC reckoned it left the door. Now, interestingly, there is a huge peak of unadvertised addresses nine years ago. Remember when we got rid of seven slash eights or something between January and April of 2011? Not all of them ever got advertised. And a bunch of those addresses that left the door in that, you know, panic of 2011, I can't see in the routing table anymore. And that's the reason why there's this massive jump. So those ones are, if you will, pre-exhaustion. Those ones are post-exhaustion. And if we had policies that say post-exhaustion, when we allocate, you should use them, by and large, that appears to be the case, that there's almost nothing that has been allocated in the last two years that is not advertised. Used and advertised are a bit different. I'm not talking about being used, but I can see them. So in the last two years, everything that's left the APNIC door as marked as allocated is basically visible in BGP. Beyond two years, yeah, starts to climb a bit. Um, I can combine those two graphs. I'm not sure what it means. Um, I should do a little bit more work on this because in some ways you allocate an address, it's advertised, and then it becomes dormant. And so the allocation date and the date it becomes dormant differ in time. And that difference in time is actually the difference between those two curves, between the last advertised age and the registry age. But same observation, 50% of the unadvertised addresses are older than eight years, 30% are older than 22 years. Where are they? Well, the geo databases still work because they're assigned addresses. They're not nowhere, they are somewhere. And the last known location uh, in terms of country and the number of addresses that are assigned, sorry, in that economy, use the right word, in that economy are indeed in that table. Um, you can read as well as I can, hopefully. Is that all visible? Yeah. Good, fine. Nothing more to say. Um, that's a lot of addresses. 4.4 million reserved, rough terms 115 million unadvertised. If you release those 4.4 and you take the long-term consumption trend out of APNIC, you'd actually get another further three years at the current consumption rate in the current last slash eight policy regime. So at the rate we give them out, those 4.4 million addresses would last a further three years at the at rate. Change the policy, change the rate. Uh, the 115 million is kind of interesting because as far as APNIC is concerned, they're somewhere else, they're not in the registry. And one line of thought is that APNIC doesn't need to do anything, the market will. Because in theory, in theory, at the right price, folk will sell economics. Will they? What's the right price? This is a condensation of market data from a number of the brokers. The key one I actually think is the one on the top left that points to a stable price since around late 2018 that oscillates between $20 and $22 per address. So it's steady. It's not rising. So if you weren't prepared to sell in 2018 because you thought the price was too low, nothing's changed between then and today. The price hasn't moved. So if price is going to flush, the market is not telling them to sell because the market's not changing the unit price. So as far as I can see, you can divide this up, that there are at least 30 million of those addresses which are as old as APNIC. We inherited them. They're buried in legacy. And quite frankly, the current market price 
does not provide incentive for whoever they might be to emerge, demonstrate that they're theirs and sell them. Whatever's being done with those addresses, not being advertised, never seen them, a lot of it. So I don't know, but that's the data. Obviously this raises some questions, or maybe it doesn't, maybe it's all clear. I'd be happy to try and answer them. Thank you. Please. George, Mike, George Michelson, AP Nick. I am the registry product manager, and you are talking about the behavior of the systems that are the core registry function, the maintenance of the things that we call the pools, the pools of address that we have authority over from which we make delegations. So this actually is squarely and firmly in my area of activity. I'm Your bailiwick, if I could use I word. don't want to use that word. But you said... I love that word. I don't look inside the machine. I, Jeff, you said, I only go with all, publicly All this comes visible. from published BGP data right. and published daily stats file so data. I am the machine. Hi. And machine. I would like to talk to you about some mechanistic behaviours of the machine. The machine has a very simple model of what can be given out. And if we flip the switch for the ranges that lie in the pool space that is denoted 103 slash 8, the machine as it currently stands does not understand the distinction between has previously been used and is now available and has never been used. And we will automatically switch to a mode where anything that is marked available in the pool from 103 is given out. It just works. So what you're saying is you do not maintain a last seen in routing date. I calculated that and that's my input in this presentation. And yes. we have no policy-driven driver that has taken us to understanding the decision when do we flip that switch? Which is why I'm presenting this because, quite frankly, this is a policy issue about what the community wants to do but, about the end of days. But as a result of other work that of necessity must be done and is in my roadmap for completion by Q2 2020, the ability to flip that switch and convert to a mode of operation where we consciously and deliberately reuse previously routed 103 will be done. There is a small body of work that will be done that makes the decision significantly easier to apply. So when this room and this process determines, yes, we're going to do this, the mechanistic behind the door machine is heading to being ready mid-2020. That's all I wanted to say. We're not hoarding it, we're making the machine I, able to do it. No one ever said anything about hoarding. At least I didn't. And, I'm and not going to ask for a recall of the transcript. Uh, you're right, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not using the H verb. Um, and, and this is really not about behaviours, it's actually about the data. Yeah. And, and the one piece of data that APNIC has not integrated into its thinking and presentations has actually been about the relationship between the routing system and our allocation system. Yeah. And, and this is, if you will, the bit that's actually here where I talk about the age of the components of these yeah. pools. So it, it's a small thing sure. and it isn't something that should have any consequence for what we say here. Sure. But there is, for now, for the lifetime of having remaining fragments of what you used to call the bottom of the barrel, things that have never been seen, they have a delicious quality compared to things that have been seen. And you, I don't quite know what we call this anymore, but essentially it is they're not tainted. Oh, the no really old ones. Belief. The really old ones are more unknown than the ones that were seen, say, 
20 years ago, 10 years ago. Right. And the ones we saw last month, we probably think we know who they are. So the yeah. thing here is that by continuing in a process where we use the front of the ring buffer analogy and we give out clean things to new entrants, they get a piece of address space that in general sense hasn't had a prior history. If we start opening the door of giving them out the back of the, the ring buffer, everybody gets an address that in some sense has a prior history. And some people tend to say, oh, unexpected things are happening in routing, I don't like this address block. Now, I can't fix that, you can't fix that, none of us have a time machine. And there's a hypothetical future state where all addresses have a prior history. We can't actually say clean addresses and tainted addresses. The concept won't exist. But during this narrowing window, we are giving people what you could moralistically call slightly cleaner addresses. They're new. But that is only an observation. It is not a policy act or even an operational practice. It's just an observation. Uh, thank you, George. And, uh, and uh, we're running out of time. We'd sure. love to have more discussion on it. And probably this presentation also leads to a few more thinking and research, actually, that uh, what happened to the uh, <coughs> allocated space, not in part of the level. And, and thank you, Jeff. And uh, thank you very much for the presentation. And uh, I'll hand it over to Button. Yes, um, well, is it working? Yeah, Jordi. Uh, start with the modification of uh, transfer policy, Prop uh, 130, version 2. OK. Um, this is the second version of a policy proposal that was, I, if I recall correctly, informally presented a couple of meetings ago, and then we did, uh, uh, or, or in the previous meeting, and, and uh, I got some, some inputs, and, and, and uh, I uh, taken th those inputs uh, in, in, a, in a new version. Um, so the, the, the problem here is that um, we have um, transfer policies for, for both before V6 and ASN. Um, and uh, in different regions, we have different ways to, to, to do those transfers, either as transfers or in cases like mergers and acquisitions. So in the current text in this region for the mergers and acquisitions, it's not clear, uh, or at least from my perspective, it's not perfectly clear if it's contemplating all the cases or only within the region or also outside uh, or if a company only sells part of it and they are using part of the resources is this is allowed or not etc um, so that's that's uh, basically what what I am trying to solve and if this works okay um, so this is this is what I am trying to, to solve with this um, policy proposal um, there is different support in, in different regions. Uh, for example, merger and acquisitions, if I recall correctly, in RIPE and AFRENIC uh, right now, uh, they are not policies, they are internal uh, procedures uh, because they consider this uh, uh, um, uh, a business uh, thing, not, not a policy. But in the other regions, uh, it's, it's uh, uh, policies, right? So we are half and half, more or less. Um, so because basically, in the existing manual in this region, policy manual in the region, we have one section for B4, one section for B6, and one section for, for ASN. What I did is basically look at the existing text and update it exactly the same way for each of those resources. So in this case, uh, for IPv4, uh, what you have in the screen, the, the smaller text, the one in the, in the, in the left, um, is uh, the existing text, and the other one is the, the text I am proposing, and I am highlighting with red color the, the key changes, right? So the actual text for IPv4, uh, we have mergers and acquisitions. APNIC will process and record the transfer of IPv4 resources as a result of the merger and acquisition, and I am proposing to add uh, relocations because uh, if we are talking about companies that may move from one region to another, uh, which is a perfect valid case. Um, I think it makes clear uh, if we add that, that, that word, relocation as well. 
So the, the, the proposed change is APNE will process and record the transfer of IP for uh, resources as the result of a partial or complete merger acquisition, reorganization, or relocation, and supporting both intra-rear and inter-rear. Uh, uh, and this was the, the text, the, 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 the second paragraph I have here, this is the text that was amended as a result of inputs. I, I, I tend to recall that it was a legal, a legal counsel from APNIC that suggested that we should clarify it. So it's in the case of inter-RIR, uh, the counterpart RIR need to have a reciprocal policy or procedure that allows it. I say policy procedure because as I just mentioned in some regions, it's not a policy, it's a procedure. So we need to take in consideration both situations. Exactly the same change for, for IPv6. I don't think I need to read it. It's exactly uh, the same, no difference, and exactly for uh, ASNs. Uh, so what is the advantage of the proposal? Well, fulfilling the objecting that I am, I am trying to reach. Uh, disadvantage, uh, this was part of the discussion as well. Uh, it could be considered that uh, this can create further desegregation, especially in the case of IPv6. Uh, however, uh, my perception is that the number of uh, inter-RIR cases that will happen will be really, really small. So I don't think that will be a high impact. And we know uh, policies say uh, or suggest that you should uh, announce as a single aggregate, but at the end, probably in, IPv in IPv4 is terrible. Sometimes you have 1,000 disaggregate uh, dis uh, pieces of, of a big prefix, but in IPv6, probably is two, three average. I, I don't really think this is going to be a big impact. Uh, and that's it, references to uh, similar policies that uh, we are discussing in other regions as well, and, and so on. I am going to keep, maybe if I can go back, yeah. I am going to keep one of the slides as the text is the same. I keep just one, whatever. And so we can follow the discussion based on that text. Inputs, comments. You're about to comment or just taking pictures? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Mike Burns from IP Trading. <clears throat> Will the loosening of the standards to allow partial mergers, acquisitions, relocations impact the waiting periods? In other words, various registries have various waiting periods uh, after which you receive a transfer before you can resell it, or an allocation. And in, in Aaron, we've seen ways around this by um, somebody who has to wait to sell their addresses will instead do a merger or acquisition. And those addresses, as a result of that process, do not then have a waiting period before they can be resold. So I think the community should consider whether um, the implementation of this policy will provide some workaround for waiting periods that the communities have placed um, in their regions. Do you know how it impacts, you know, the other regions? Yeah, I, I understand your point. Uh, uh, however, in, in the policy text, both the actual and what I am proposing, we are leaving the staff the freedom to look for documentation as they wish, and also to check those documents which, in the case of uh, inter-RIR, which the other uh, counterpart of RIR, uh, I think it will be difficult to, 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 to escape from that control if you are trying to cheat the system, right? Well, I don't know. It's uh, there are big differences in the way registries treat these um, mergers and acquisitions. For example, in RIPE, you can't do one of these merger and acquisition transfers without government papers from relevant um, agencies documenting the divestiture acquisition. Whereas in the Aaron community, you can, and in LACNIC, 
you can divest just a, a, a product line or a network or a region, and there are no um, you know, jurisdictional documents. It's just a business case, and Aaron will review that and accept that without requiring you know, anything from any government. So, you know, people are always looking for a way to get around things. We talked about the, the, the impact of the five-year waiting period on the 103 pool just recently. So people do look for ways to get around waiting periods, and a merger and an acquisition that doesn't have a waiting period that starts at that process provides that workaround. Just something to consider because the waiting periods vary from region to region. And if you can do this interregionally, it provides another method to get around that waiting period. Thank you. Any further comments or remarks? No? I think Secretariat has a, uh, staff have some comments on some technical issues. So, George, you want to read out or I get, oh yeah. Uh, so a few comments here. Uh, so from services um, perspective, we might have uh, difficulties in verifying certain mergers, acquisitions and reorganizations uh, or relocation from out of region um, due to unfamiliar, familiar, 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 oh geez, due to unfamiliar, uh, oh, can't say that word. Yeah, I can't say that word for some reason. Um, of languages and legal systems. The NRO comparative policy matrix indicates APNIC members outside of the region must have network presence in the Asia Pacific. Additionally, some RIRs have an out of region policy which restricts where they can use their resources. Members may face difficulties updating their domain objects if there have been a partial IPv6 transfer where a larger block has been deaggregated. Uh, technical comments, uh, our current systems are not configured to handle into RAR uh, v6 reverse DNS, and this will need to be developed, uh, and we cannot predict when the other RARs will support v6 reverse DNS fragments coming into the systems. And legal comments, uh, this will affect how we verify m &A documents and will possibly require cross RAR coordination. Uh, that's it. I, I recall I responded in the list to those inputs. I think most of them are uh, operational uh, and it's, it, we are giving, not having explicit text, uh, the, the secretariat, the, the, the way to decide by themselves how they do, how they coordinate with other registries. Uh, I agree with the possible impact in the reverse delegation. Uh, I think at some point during the the meeting or yesterday I heard already George commenting about that. So, so yeah, we are aware and as said, I don't think we will see so many cases as will create a real impact. Uh, and of course, uh, if, for example, we reach consensus on this proposal and APNIC implements it, it may happen that some parts uh, of the proposal like doing transfers for mergers and acquisitions which another registry cannot be done until the, only, the other registry is ready as yet. We, we understand that. That's, that's the case for any policy involving different regions, right? And we had uh, comments as well on the mailing list from the Japan Upon Policy Forum, who mainly opposing this proposal. I, I think I responded to that as well in the list. I don't remember my email. Unfortunately, not being able to use my computer here, I cannot show it now, but it's possible to, yeah. No more comments or remarks? So now we'll go for the consensus call.
not a split? Yeah, because maybe some people don't agree on the IPv6 and the other VI, so yeah. Yeah, so we're, um, after the discussion, we split the Prop 130 in three parts. One for the IPv4, one for the ASN, and one for the IPv6, because most of the opposition are for the IPv6 part. The confer open. So the one in the screen showing ASN. Yeah, any 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 order, but, okay, but yeah. just, so, just so to we make start sure with that the, the people know. <coughs> we start with the ASN only. Um, so if you strongly support this proposal, just for the ASN part, please raise your hand. Of course. Thank you. <laughs> <coughs> if you support this proposal, please raise your hand. Okay, if you are neutral to this proposal, raise your hand. If you oppose this proposal, please raise your hand. Thank you. And if you strongly oppose this proposal, please raise your hand and express yourself. Thank you. So, sorry to say, but for the ASN, uh, we didn't reach a consensus. Uh, so, can we move to the IPv4 part? Confer on the screen, please. Yeah, now it's in the screen. So now we're on the part for IPv4 only. Well, what a few seconds for uh, people to express themselves on the confer part. So if you strongly su uh, support this proposal, please raise your hand. If you support this proposal, please raise your hand. If you are neutral to this proposal, please raise your hand. If you oppose this proposal, please raise your hand. And if you strongly oppose this proposal, please raise your hand and express yourself. Thank you. It didn't reach consensus either. So for the IPv6 part, it's on. So, uh, if you strongly support this proposal, please raise your hand. If you support this proposal, raise your hand. If you are neutral to this proposal, please raise your hand. 
If you oppose this proposal, please raise your hand. And if you strongly oppose this proposal, raise your hand. Thank you. So this proposal definitely didn't reach consensus. As usual, please, those that are opposing or strongly opposing, it will be good to raise their voice in the mailing list so we can see if it makes sense to update the proposal or, or withdraw it or whatever. Thank you. Thank you, Jordi. <coughs> um, I think this proposal is for uh, for this is the second meeting we are discussing, and it's the mailing list for quite a long time. And we, in the mailing list, uh, the primary observation is getting opposing most of the part of it. So uh, I think uh, we can uh, ask for another consensual meeting that uh, sh should be abandoning this proposal. Maybe you are not. Uh, we don't need this, or community feels. Or, or maybe we don't understand that. We need more understanding on that. So we can wait for it for some time before further discussion. I, I think that that will be the ideal because the problem is that we only get uh, one comment two days before the, the meeting, basically, or two comments. And I think what I can try to do is immediately after the meeting, try to foster some discussion and depending on that, decide. Okay. Sunny, you want to make any comment? Exactly, that's what I just wanted the clarification whether we're going to put this proposal on the mailing list. Um, but you are calling for a consensus to abandon the proposal here in the room. Yeah, that um, is something I think uh, I was thinking that uh, whether we can do that if. Well, you can only <coughs> do it if uh, the author wishes, wishes uh, not to withdraw the proposal. Right, yeah, yeah, and yeah right. Keep continue the discussions on the, with the community. But yeah, if you can. Um, so, Jody? I, I think we should try. I mean, we got today inputs from, from Mike. Uh, we had inputs in the last two days. Maybe we can give a try. I don't know. Okay. So we can, we can talk okay. about this uh, in the next few weeks, if necessary. Yeah, right. So uh, we'll keep it to the mailing list because yep. you want to. And uh, <clears throat> I would propose that if we can't still reach consensus at the next APNIC meeting in Bangladesh, we will just drop the proposal. Okay. You okay with that? Yeah. Good. So this uh, Prop uh, 130 is going back to the mailing list. Thank you. Okay. So we uh, move to the next. Uh, Part proposal 133, because of a question on sub-assignment. And please, uh, Jody, make the yep. presentation. If we get the slides. Yeah. OK. Um, this proposal, or a previous one, better say, uh, has been in discussion, I think, for the last two or three meetings. Uh, is, is a topic that has been discussed in all the other RIRs, uh, and the reason for that is all the APV6 policy, uh, policies come from a joint original policy developed, if I recall correctly, by Aiden, APNIC, and RIPE, because the other registries didn't exist at that time. So uh, my understanding is that as in other changes that we have been doing in the APV6 policy uh, recently, uh, we duplicated the, the text in such a way that if something was uh, not clear or broken, uh, we were doing the same mistake everywhere, right? So first thing I need to, to make sure everybody understand, uh, because in the previous discussions we got, there was some misunderstanding, is that this is not relevant to allocations. It's relevant only to assignments, either to end users or assignments that in the policy uh, manual we uh, use for uh, specific parts of the LIR infrastructure, okay? Um, 
So again, we are not changing with this policy, if it reaches consensus, uh, anything related to the big allocation that the LIR will get for their subscribers, for their customers. Um, the original, uh, let's say, goal of this policy or, or this part of the text of this policy was that if you get an assignment, is for you. If you are an enterprise, if you are a university, it's only for you. And the idea is you can use for whatever usage within your own network, within your own organization you want to do, but not to sub-assign to third parties, okay? I think that's clear, but the problem is that the text the actual text has a must together with documented purposes. The result of that is that if I am, for example, in a university, I document my request to APNIC for an assignment saying I am going to use this assignment for the equipment of my network for my own servers. And after a few years, you start deploying wireless for your visitors or your guests this is not matching anymore the original documented purpose. So you will be violating the policy. So you have two ways to resolve that. You come back to APNIC and you do a new documentation and APNIC accept that, or we recognize that this was the way it was uh, written, but not the original intent, and we change that. So this is what I am trying to do. So the idea is not to change at any point that now you can give to third parties. No, it's to make clear that the original intent, that's why I say clarification, maybe uh, this confused people, but it's how I read it in Spanish, my native language. It was not, I give this for you only for your machine that you documented in the original document is for anything within your infrastructure, okay? Not for third parties, uh, not for super signing to third parties. Uh, I mentioned this because there was some discussion about the language in the mailing list and I think uh, it's important to clarify this usage of the clarification wording. Uh, what happens is that while we have been using mainly IPv4, Nobody realizes it about this because most of the time you get addresses, but to your visitors or your guests, you use NAT. So you don't violate the policy, even if you are using addresses indirectly for purposes that were not in initially documented. Okay? But in IPv6, we don't have NAT. We use always global addresses. So in IPv6, we will be violating the policy at any time if we documented only a very restrictive part of our own network, okay? Uh, I already mentioned the example, so I, I am not going to repeat it. An enterprise or a university uh, is um, starting to use the addresses for new things that were not originally documented. So that's it. The objective of the policy change is to make sure that we read the text understanding that this, the assignment is just for your own infrastructure, for your own network, or for visitors in your network, but within your network, not for other third parties. Uh, this has been already amended in all the other RIRs. I think it's important to mention that, as the same I mentioned at the beginning, that all the IPv6 policies come from the original policy text. So how we how I am proposing to, to, to resolve that, again, uh, in your left you have the original text, and uh, the original text say uh, assigned addresses spaces, address space that is delegated to an LIR or end user for a specific use within the, the infrastructure they operate, uh, must only be made for a specific documented purposes and may not be supersigned. So again, must and documented. If you forgot to mention something, you will be violating the policy. If now you uh, do something different, right? So 
the change, which even uh, is making the text shorter. There was a comment uh, from version one from the staff that I addressed with this small change is assign it address spaces, address space that is delegated to an LIR or an end user for exclusive use within the infrastructure they operate. That's it. So we don't change the behavior, we just facilitate that anyone that documented one usage but now is extending the usage is still within his own network is not uh, formally violating the policy. Uh, advantages, resolving the problem basically. Uh, I don't see any possible disadvantage. I don't see any impact on resource holders and that's it. And I am going to again keep in the screen if there is any input or comment the text that we have. Thank you. Okay, thanks uh, Jordi. Uh, any uh, comments or question from uh, audience? Uh, welcome to the mic. Uh, Jen. I feel that the existing language covers in detail this uh, proposed language appears to be very restrictive and very very sharp. Existing language says assignment must only be made for a specific documented purpose. So it gives uh, so some leeway and it will be very difficult to establish that how do we define internet infrastructure they operate? So the present language allows a specific documented purpose that leeway is allowed so that somebody can explain that the infrastructure which I operate and maintain, how I do, and it says must only there. So I think we, we should not change it. Thank you. If, if you look at the, the previous version that, that we discussed it in the previous meeting, it had some uh, inputs that you actually provided. You were, if I recall correctly, supporting that, that proposal. Um, I don't think with this text, which is much simple, we are breaking those. I think it's, and according also to the, to the assessment by the staff, if I understood correctly, for them, this is much clearer, shorter, and it don't gives uh, the, the it don't facilitate anyone to break the original intended rules. On the other way around, it facilitates that if somebody forgot to document something but is within the infrastructure, they can do it. In, in such a case, uh, what is the issue with the existing language? I mean, if if we staff. So what we are saying that the staff should exercise those rights. This will be problematic for the staff. I have nothing more to add, thank you. Sunny, Sunny Chandu from APNIC. Um, the existing does, uh, text doesn't have any issues with the Secretariat staff. Uh, Simon again from Fiber at Home. Uh, uh, Jordi, uh, if you think about like a big network, like uh, if I can name Reliance Geo, is it possible to like, if they change their network often, and they have a regional network, and they then change it all of a sudden, and missed out some documentation. Is there any, any problem with the present text? We are saying no, right? No, but, but remember, this is not for an allocation. They, they don't have an allocation. They, don't, they, they, they have an allocation, not an assignment. Assignment, so the present, I think, what you are having the left and the right covers, like the left one covers everything. So I don't need to, I don't think that it needs to be changed. Thank you. Again, uh, let me to repeat it. If you documented when you requested your assignment that you are going to connect only your routers and now you want to connect visitors, you are outside the policy. Yes, because it was not documented. <clears throat> um, I have a comment. 
Uh, English is not my native language as well. Neither mine. <laughs> None of us. Uh, the way I understand the policy, the actual policy is the way it's written, saying that I ask for IP addresses, I get assigned, and I do what I want with them within the documentation I provided to the APNIC. Um, it's up to me to foresee what I'm going to do with the, the, the IP addresses. And the part I like in this policy is and may not be sub-assigned, which is the part that you removed for your um, uh, policy proposal. Um, but I understand it very easily, and it's pretty clear. You can do what you want, provided that it's written in the document. If you intend to modify uh, the way you use the assigned addresses, then you have to modify the document that was used to get the assignment. Okay. So it's... Uh, by modifying this policy, you're modifying the, this uh, core thing that you could just m do whatever you want with it and not report it. So um, I just removed my co-chair hat, uh, and as a community member from the Pacific region, I oppose this proposal. Okay. Regarding, regarding the removal of the may not be superlocated, in version one, we have that text. The secretariat told us, or told me, that it's not necessary because I already put uh, for exclusive use. So it's a duplication, okay? Now, regarding the documentation, do you think it makes sense if 20 years ago, you got an assignment. There was no wireless at that time, or was not common. That now you need to change your documentation. Wireless has got nothing to do with it. It's well, just, it's one example that you uh, are you, doing you, a different you've usage. Got, you've got, uh, like, I don't know, I've uh, got a slash 24 for your servers, a slash 22 for uh, your uh, daily operation and office and everything. 20 years ago, everyone was plugged in. Now, everyone is wireless you still operate the IP addresses within what was planned initially. It depends on how you grow that document, because maybe in that document, your you language was... It was only plugged? No, no, no your language, said. in that document, your language, maybe it was like, for all my devices now is also my guest devices. Just like when you have a flat that you rent and you invite people in it, it's not sub-renting, even if you make them pay to come to your place. Exactly. And we are making it clear. It's not sub-renting. It's not a super-location, precisely. Okay. Thanks for <laughs> your uh, explain. Let's the next the comments uh, from uh, Vajish, Vajish and okay. uh, Sorry. Uh, Brajesh Jain again. I would like to add that this nature of network is constantly changing. What we thought that this is our network, suddenly with the software-defined network, SDN networks, with the, some part of my machine going to the uh, cloud, I may not have router at all, actually. It could be called, I don't know by what name, it could be an appliance, it could be a switch. So to be able to, and this, this change uh, will, will be disturbing all that. So we, we should have the freedom and the flexibility so, so my, I continue my opinion that we should not change it. Thank you. Thanks. I, I see precisely the other way around. Right now, with the existing text, we don't have this flexibility. What I am trying to do is to make sure that we have that flexibility. The important goal of this policy part, or this part of the policy, was that you don't sub-allocate. I am trying to make sure that anything that is not sub-allocation is allowed. Okay, so That's the flexibility, precisely. Okay, we know you are... You need that, uh, Mike yes, Burns, IP Trading. I support the proposal. I don't think it makes a lot of sense to uh, track the usage of IP resources uh, per their original intent. 
we see IP addresses that are being used for things that are wholly different from their original intent, including leasing them um, for, for purposes unrelated to their original acquisition or assignment. So I think that in an era of no scarcity in IPv6 and pricing in IPv4, the conservation will happen naturally without regards to this documentation request. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Sunny Chandi for me. Pinik, just a clarification on the point that was made, uh, the change of text there. Um, as I mentioned, you know, as a secretariat, we don't have any issues with the current policy text. But if someone is proposing to change the text, uh, then we have to do assess it and we provide our comments on the proposed text. We can't go back to the author and say, don't propose it, you know, we like it, you know, <laughs> we don't have any issues with it. So our comments, assessment comments were on the proposed text, but we don't have any issues with the current text. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So if there is no other comments, we will go to the uh, consensus. Uh, we prepare the comfort. Okay, so the company is ready. So the, if you su strongly support the, this proposal, uh, please uh, raise your hand. Okay, so if you support this proposal, uh, please raise your hand. Okay, thanks. Uh, if you are neutral uh, about this proposal, please raise your hand. Okay, thanks. The, uh, if you oppose this proposal, uh, please raise your hand. Okay, thanks. The, uh, if you strongly oppose this proposal, uh, please your, raise your hand. Okay, thanks. Hmm? Also, uh, uh, based on the consensus, the, so it's, uh, it did not uh, reach the consensus the, for this proposal. Okay, thanks, Jody. Thank you. Yeah, <coughs> thanks, Jody. But uh, this proposal also actually in the list for, uh, in the discussion for quite a few years, actually, I should say that. Uh, well, it, I, and, uh, I changed it totally. I mean, it yeah. was much but, more but complex. But this time, I can see some support as well. I tried to well. simplify it. We, we can see some support as well, but a large number of portion is opposing it. And uh, in the mailing list also, we got some opposition, and it is consensus. But uh, it is up to you if, if you want to continue this further or. Yeah, I, it's pity because uh, um, the, the guys from India, uh, sorry, I, I, I cannot spell correctly the name, so I prefer not to, to make a mistake. The guys from India were supporting it in the previous version and now not, so I need to talk to them to, to, to find an agreement on, on, on how, how we do that text. Okay, let's move to the next policy, the last one. Yep. We are running Thank out you. of time. Oh yeah, it's going back to my yeah. list. It's also one time that we can see some support from the floor, so yeah. Okay, same or similar situation to the previous uh, proposal. Um, I have, I have uh, got a previous version of this proposal, which to be honest was too complex. I was, I was trying to change in one shot the full PDP and, uh, and uh, the inputs I got were I support this part, but not the other. So now I am trying to restrict the change to a very, very minor part, at least for now, the, the one that I consider more important. So um, part of it is, as you can see, we are using the comfort. And 
in the future, instead of comfort, can be a, a different electronic way to measure or to gauge consensus, right? So the point is uh, also the chairs state clearly that they are also looking at the mailing list. But if you look at the formal text of the PDP, none of them is there, okay? I don't think that's right. Uh, if we don't have in the policy, in the PDP text, uh, the way we do that, how we are following the PDP? We are not, definitively, okay? So this is part of the change. There is another change which is uh, making clear that uh, we have a formal process to withdraw a proposal uh, instead of asking the authors to keep editing it uh, uh, or, or not editing it if they have uh, inputs from, from the community. So if authors are not proactive, it will expire. That's it. In six months, or you keep editing it, or it expires, so nobody needs to, to do anything else. Uh, and then basically, uh, the actual text is calling uh, something which is general consensus that yes, is defined in the SIG guidelines, but there is not any link formally between our PDP and the guidelines. So how come I know that the guidelines are part of the PDP? Even if in the slides for the co-chairs we have it every time, etc., etc. I think that's not right. The PDP is our rule, and it should be very clear and have cross-references with other documents if they apply. And those need to be decided by the community. I was told that those guidelines were developed about two decades ago by the chairs, the six chairs. We had at that time many six. Now is not uh, the same situation. So we need to clarify that. Uh, so while well, I am trying to resolve those problems, uh, I am not going to explain how is the PDP in every region because it's quite different. There are some similarities, but not, not that many. And the change I am proposing is only to the step two in our five steps PDP. Again, in the left, you have the existing text, and I have a uh, market which read the major changes that I am proposing. So. Uh, I am talking about consensus determination because right now it talks about consensus on the OPM, but we are actually looking at the mailing list, so it's not just in the OPM. That's the first big change. It's not a big change. We are already doing that, but it's not formally part of the process. Then I am using the definition of consensus that we are using in all the RIRs, which is the same from the ITF, which is route consensus. We have a discussion the last few days uh, in the list, and at the end, Adam Gosling was telling me, look, route, uh, general agreement means this. If you strongly oppose, uh, it's, it's not. And I said, okay, that's exactly the same as route consensus. So it's just changing the name to be something that is a standard, not something that we define in another document, not linked to our PDP. And then consensus is determined first considering the sick mailing list, other electronic means, which includes uh, um, Confer, um, and the sick session, and afterwards at the member meeting. So basically I am not changing what we are doing, but I am making it clear in our PDP. If there is no consensus on a proposal, the authors can decide to withdraw it, Otherwise, the proposal will be considered as expired by the next OPM unless a new version is provided restarting the discussions in the mailing list. And that's it. Uh, I think that uh, the advantage is that we will be really following the PDP if we accept this, because right now we are not following the PDP. Sorry, but it's like that, and nobody can tell me otherwise. Um, no disadvantage, no impact, uh, references to similar changes that have been done in other registries, and I go back to the key slide, which is the proposed text. There has been a discussion in the, in the mailing list. Adam was also proposing some changes in the language, but this has been too close to the meeting. We already did a second version on Monday uh, as uh, following the, the, the staff analysis. 
So I was thinking if only one person in the list is providing this and, and I was asking, please, if someone else is supporting that, say it now so we can change in a third version, otherwise I keep with this text, which I think is acceptable. That's it, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jordi. And uh, just to clarify one thing that uh, you were mentioning about uh, PDP. And uh, we actually, we follow PDP, we also follow C guidelines, okay? And, uh, and uh, I think if you follow the last 10 years or history that uh, every time we are telling that we do this, 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 we are following mailing list, we incorporate confer, even we can move to any other literature in, in, in future. There's no doubt about it, I fully aligned with you. And so, and this uh, general agreement and rough definition consensus is defined into our guidelines. So, we, we, it's not, not only about following PDB, then uh, if you go for that, then again actually we're conflicting with our guidelines. So, and another information I must provide, during the last meeting, we, uh, the similar proposal was there with few additional things, and uh, it was got rejected at that time, and, uh, and you are absolutely true that this uh, document was written uh, long ago, and uh, I, so far I know the Secretary has taken an initiative to actually rewrite the documents, right? Sunny, can you please update on that as actually, that uh, what Secretary is doing regarding PDP and guidelines and other documents? Uh, thank you, Chair. So, Sunny from APNIC. Um, as, uh, yeah, you're right, it was discussed in the last meeting and uh, the EC, our executive board members, directed a secretariat to review the documents, all the policy documents. So we will be doing that this year and most probably reporting in APNIC 50. Yeah. Um, I just want to, since I'm here, I just want to make a clarification on the, yes, it's the PDPs are different in different regions and uh, we have a different way of looking at here. Um, the SIG guidelines and the PDP go hand in hand, okay, because they're all developed by the community, agreed by the, all the individual SIG, SIG chairs and co-chairs. We had many SIGs in the past. Uh, it was all agreed. Um, and also, the actual PDP document is very simple. It got four steps in there, and it says, you know, by the headings, you can see consensus process. But when you look at the consensus document, which is a lengthy one, it does say in there that the chase will take consideration of the mailing list, consideration of the confer and show of hands. If you want me to read it, you know, I can read it, but it's there, it's written. So you have to look at, we didn't, I agree we didn't link that to the document from the PDP, but we can do that after the review is complete, you know, if that's recommended, or suggested. But currently everyone is, I think, do go and look at, you know, what it is and what the consensus process is like in this region. Thank you. The, the problem, uh, Sunny, is I understand that, but I don't think it's so simple as taking the web page where we have the PDP and having a link to the guidelines, because that will need the approval of the community. That's my point. We cannot just do that, because we don't necessarily agree with the guidelines which were developed by, uh, by a different group of people, not the community, but the six chairs 20 years ago. That's, that's the point, what I am trying to make. Uh, Sunny, again, well, those guidelines, there's not guidelines, they are actually consensus process of this region and it was agreed by the community. We just didn't document that in the PDP uh, documentation, you know, we actually have a separate web page for that. What I meant we didn't link is, you know, we should have, when it referred to consensus, we should have linked that to that page, you know, where it actually explains clearly what a consensus process is and what happened this chair's responsibilities, everything. We just, I mean, I don't know if you need a consensus for that from the community to link that document to that. Please no, no, ahead, no. You know. What I am saying is that I, I've tried to follow the story of the guidelines and I don't see in the history where the community agreed on those. That's my point. Uh, are you trying to change the PDP no. or, the poly, uh, or the SIG guideline? What I am trying to say is that we don't need the guidelines. Uh, yes, we do. No. It's, it says policy SIG, therefore we have to follow the SIG guidelines. If, if we want the guidelines as they are right now or with changes, we should then review the guidelines as a community. That's my point. Yeah, okay. yeah definitely. I agree to that and that review is, uh, we will definitely do the review after 
the secretary yet actually do their research, then definitely we will do that. Warren Finch from AP Nick. Just a question to you, Sami. If there's a conflict between those two documents, which is the overriding document? Uh, no, there's no conflict actually. But if there is, uh, but if there yeah, is it's conflict, there is there is, is a conflict like? in my point of view. I exactly. I don't know exactly. I'm looking for Sanjay here for help. <laughs> uh, but there's no conflict. Is yeah. There's yeah. Conflict, you'll be able to yeah. There's no conflict. But if there is conflict, I don't know what was the process in the past. The former document will win. The yeah. formal is the PDP, and that's um, the thing. Yeah. Sorry, that's okay. The thing. Regarding the SIG guidelines, yes, the community can review them, uh, but I'd just like to say that um, that reviewed document should go through all the SIGs, okay? Yeah. Existing SIGs. Well, not necessarily. Yes, the SIG guidelines because are for all the SIGs. What I am trying to say is that m maybe the community decide that it's not necessary to have the same guidelines for the policy that for the others, because the other working groups, the other six, don't make policies. So not necessarily you need the same process. Yeah, that's a valid point, yes. Okay, thank you very much. So I think it's time for going for consensus again on the policy. So can you see the conference screen? And uh, those who are actually attending remotely, please, Send your uh, that's, that's not the one. feedbacks to confer. No. Yeah. So, those who strongly support this proposal, please raise your hand. Thank you. If you support the proposal, please raise your hand. Thank you. If you strongly oppose the proposal, sorry, if, if you're neutral, please raise your hands. Sorry about that. Okay. Thank you. If you oppose the proposal, please put your hand up. Okay. Thank you. If you strongly oppose the proposal, please raise your hand. Thank you. So, uh, looking at the room temperature, confer, and mailing list, so we can say that the proposal. Can I reach make a proposal consensus? about this? Please. Uh, I think the ideal way to resolve this will, will be to create, I don't know if calling task force to have some thinking on this people from the community that volunteer to participate, and then provide inputs, and then maybe draft a new policy proposal, and meanwhile, keep this one, this one uh, dormant or abandon it or whatever is necessary. Thank you. That may be a way. Uh, Sunny from APNIC, may I suggest, Jody, that since the EC directed AP Secretariat to review the documents, let us finish that review of the documents. We'll present that, the recommendations of the document, and then the community can do whatever they want to do after that. You know, if they want to put a proposal in, you know, is that a fair call? My point is that this is a community decision, not. Yeah, otherwise, asking, it's not. No, I'm asking you as an author and the. Otherwise, it's yeah. not bottom-up approach. Yes, you know, definitely. That's the thing. So, is that a fair call for this community? Because it was discussed last time, and the EC said, you know, okay, let's review it because it's keep coming up, and we will do it. I am happy waiting for, the, for that review and then going into a task force or whatever we see is necessary, but not accepting the review as the final decision. Oh, definitely okay. not at all, actually. This okay. is the review, it will be reviewed by the Secretariat, then it will come to the policy SIG, and if the community agrees, community misses the modification, addition, deletion, after all yep. that, actually, and. Uh, when the community agrees, then we can make the changes. So I am I am fine with that, and uh, we just need to to know the timing for that review and how we can provide the inputs. So before going to that level, uh, uh, I'm suggesting that we we abandon the proposal here. In that in that situation, uh, if we have how how much time you think you you will get that review? 
It is April 50. Next, okay. next conference, yeah. Meanwhile, I am happy to withdraw the proposal. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. So Thank the, you. the proposal is withdrawn by the author.